Welcome everybody. Tuesday, April 24, OSC meeting, OSC dev team, 2 p.m. Central Time. So yeah, recording this for anybody who misses this. Uh, agenda for today, so I'll just talk briefly about where we are in the project, and then uh, I'm not seeing anyone, as far as typically what we do is in the agenda, <clears throat> we type in what, what we're, how much time we need, so I need about 10 or 15 minutes to go over the current state then go from there so uh, I want but I want to start with the develop development narrative so kind of narrowing it down if you click on page 3 to the document itself you see where we are for the year's goals um, let me uh, first actually share my screen so people can take a look at that Okay, so sharing my screen, um, page one, we've got the development graph. We are doing well on our continuous downfall here on April 23rd with the number of development hours. Um, so I think we're going to start picking up pretty soon. So the, the big next deal is uh, I'm on schedule for May 1st. Uh, if you look at the development narrative, May 1st is going to be the immersion program announcements. I've been spending a lot of time on that in terms of preparing the offer for the five-week immersion program that's going to happen in September and largely on the open source microfactory level one level one meaning the small tools of the open source microfactory 3d printer small laser cutter and CNC circuit mill and uh, filament maker for making 3d printing filament um, so we're I put that in red actually if you look at my screen that's like nice big uh, cut off by next uh, pretty much like next Monday or so um, no, Tuesday actually is the first, so that should be coming out actually exactly next week. And with that, so given that, you know, we announced that to the public, start getting initial feedback, people people looking at the program. Um, and right after that, I think the time is ripe to do the Hero X, Hero X Open Source Microfactory Challenge. So once again, the, the crowd-funded crowd design challenge where we focus on a, on a 3D printed cordless drill as a very specific product. Uh, and aiming for a professional grade 3D printed cordless drill as that microfactory challenge uh, using crowd development where the there's going to be a reward and part of that reward will be crowd funded because part of the platform is to also allows for crowd funding to happen but the main deal is if you look at after September when we're going to be training our people, then we're going to be running a number of 3D printer build workshops or CNC circuit mill or any other other tools that we have because we're going to teach people to go through that in an immersion where in the program itself, I'm looking at right now, every single week, we actually do a 3D printer workshop. So that means at some university, maybe a local library or somewhere else, but really get the people decked in the experience of what it means to run a workshop and actually do that as a revenue generating opportunity where we're building 3d printers or some of the other machines and uh, providing a deep immersion experience for people and doing that as as a source of revenue using our 3d printer so to get there we we need a little bit more work on a, on a 3d printer uh, we're developing the next iteration of that uh, just to show you where where I'm at on the on the 3d printer I Start working on, I posted this on the OSC Workshops Facebook page, but there is, um, booting that up, uh, so I've added the E3D Volcano, it's Titan Arrow, <clears throat> Volcano Titan Arrow Extruder, so this is what it looks like, but it's, uh, you can see the comments on that for some of the assembly, but that basically fits right into our D3D 3D printer, just like we hold the extruder by the by the motor, we do the same thing with this. Let's see, are there any more pictures there? Uh, if we go to actually the source post here, there's a few more pictures. Let's see if we can boot that up here. Yeah, just showing some of the assembly, but, but the idea of the 
of the extruder it's actually um, that's the way it looks not exactly because that one doesn't show the let me look at some more comments here so actually putting it together there it is in my hand and it has the big big tall uh, heater block here which allows it to have the volcano nozzles which are up to 1.2 millimeters and the cooling is on the fan that's right like right on the body of the of the extruder there <clears throat> so that we can get really fast big prints good for filaments that are flexible as well as regular filaments a total module that fits within the current D3D 3D printer <clears throat> instead of the old extruder that we were using and John is working on the other version of that let's see uh, is John on here <clears throat> I don't see John but he's he's working on a on a current 3D printer which has the Prusa i3 MK2 extruders so we're de deploying both of those at the same time you can say it's good remote prototyping where we're adding these other options to the to what we already have and this extruder is a little more expensive if you get it from E3D it costs $120 it's a lot of money uh, if you get it from China it costs like $60 and but otherwise if we build our own Prusa i3 extruder that's probably more like $30 in parts or so so definitely price differences but this is high performance meaning fast printing as well as designed well for flexible filaments because basically the the path from where the drive gear is to the to the extruder nozzle is as short as possible you can see how it's, it's rather short so that flexible filaments are well constrained as they get extruded so therefore you can print fast with with flexible filaments which is for us that's very important things like rubber tracks o-rings uh, for us it's like micro track rubber tracks is our definite possibility or even like transmission belts like for example if you I just thought about actually the baler you know the baler if you do the big round balers as agricultural equipment they have belts in there that form the round bale they're like about 10 like 20 20 or so foot long rubber belts and with a with an extruder like this you can print rubber embedded with nylon so basically like nylon belted rubber strips you can you can do this with uh, if we develop this on our 3d printer even if you have say like a two by two foot for surface you can print the belt vertically so it stands on edge and curl it around so you could get like 10 meters or so easily on uh, like a two by two foot print bed for things like parts for our baler for real agricultural equipment so this this is the kind of things that this extruder would allow you to do but that's that's good stuff um, <clears throat> next item is uh, just I want to br bring one more historical thing up as far as what's going on on this very day so exactly 10 years ago is where I first <clears throat> coined the term global village construction set so that's actually somewhat of a historical day that that was uh, when I pr made a presentation um, at let's see Missouri if, if we look at GVCS on the wiki UM presentation that's University Missouri in Columbia Missouri this is where the word global village construction set was first used in public Wednesday April 23rd, 23rd exactly 10 years ago um, so I'm actually gonna write a blog post about it I was trying to do that yesterday I didn't get to it but summarizing where we are after 10 years and uh, and promises made and promise and hopes dashed and things exceeded and all of that uh, just the whole story and I would say the yeah I mean after all these years the major learning is the continuity that which continues to be an issue and for which reason the the immersion program is intended to address that as people work full-time so basically when we run the workshops we pay people and people work essentially full-time the goal is uh, to get four people um, I think four four is a realistic number four people full-time and if we did that that would be so awesome because each person would be like 40 hours a week uh, adding to the development time where essentially we fund the project project through bootstrapped running workshops 
which now we do 3D printer later on, just about anything. But we use that to fund such that the project is completely scalable. The design rationale there is that any person that enters the project has a way to sustain themselves because we can pay them because we're running workshops in different locations around the states. And on top of that, when we have the different people around the states, and I'd like to limit that to like North America at this time, like Canada, U.S., because we're kind of familiar with these regions here, what the possibilities are, but also also run different design jams where we can hold those as as we have different people in different parts of the country we can hold those in real time uh, say like a weekend every month where we can run both a workshop and then a, like a prototyping hackathon slash open product development session where there's a lot of different products just just with a 3d printer you can think about like um, anything like you could even do insulation like 3d printed insulation which is just tr tight tightly bound spaghetti or or developing new filaments developing all kinds of consumer goods like <clears throat> anything that can be made with a 3d printer and a, and a CNC circuit mill and off-shelf parts like your your aerial drones robotic arms or whatever your phone your camera or whatever uh, which are taken to real products. So this whole open source product development methodology, with kind of the the open source everything store, like Amazon, but open source. So basically, imagine getting a lot of people involved in that kind of a a process where the main difference is the 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 critical thing is that we are doing distributive enterprise development. The products are absolutely open source and we, we give everyone the source code for how you produce that and how you can sell that you know, on a website and, and so forth. Well, so that's the 10-year history so far since the Global Village construction set was coined and the book. So I'm, I'm working on a book, as, as I think a lot of you know. Um, to be published, I mean, I don't know when. I mean, I think uh, it would be great to have it by September. I'm not sure if that's going to happen, simply because I'm really going into exploring a lot of the, pretty much a lot of the state of the world issues. Because as we go about a civilization reboot experiment, well, what are all the features of society that work or don't work? We have to explore that at depth. And I'm going through a lot of that up to things like war, you know, like is war actually decreasing or increasing? Is open source a way that we can remove resource conflicts from happening? How do we get to ending artificial scarcity? A lot of the issues are wrapped up in um, major institutions of society, from the banking system, capitalism, to how do you do farming, how do you do innovation, how do you teach people, all the institutions. So for that, I'm going to cover a lot of that in the book as background knowledge for, okay, what do we do if we actually want to try to create a global village to reinvent the world? You know? um, so, so in the book, I also propose, okay, here's our campus right now, and we don't have much, as you know, for those of you who have been here, we've got a basic workshop, we've got some living structures, but how do we move from there to the full infrastructure for full-time summer programs initially, then full-time year-round programs, and so forth, to develop a campus to reinvent the world. We can build around the idea of a university campus because that's kind of like a like a small world on its own. But the main difference for us being that we have real economic productivity, like agriculture, like manufacturing, and things that make up for a real real society so that you can actually talk about uh, real cultural and scientific advancement on a scale of a small global village. So that's, that's, that's about all I want to say on that. Um, and uh, that's the critical path development main main idea there where we're at. Uh, I want to move on to let's see. Jennifer, do you want to you want to introduce yourself briefly? So so what do you think, um, Jennifer? Uh, uh, how much time would you have to 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 contribute to the OSC Dev team here? Um. Yeah. So yeah, this, this is my this is my full time lab. I'm a call, I I want to be part of the revolution. Whoa. I want to help. 
Yeah, no, that's that's great. That's great. Well, I mean, I would definitely suggest that. I mean, um, since FreeCAD is a critical tool that we use, uh, you think you'd be able to learn that? To, to learn what? FreeCAD, the open source CAD software. We do a lot of the design work on it, and um, it's kind of the staple. I am, I am willing, I'm willing to learn whatever you would like me to learn, and yeah. um, Lex has been helping on and off with stuff, and I, can, and I can definitely dedicate some time to learning. Yes. That's awesome. Yes. Okay, so we can. Yeah, great, great. So you said, uh, so you work for Microsoft right now in catering? Is that what I heard? I work, I work for for a for a temp agency for Wolfgang Puck. Okay. Microsoft. I'm actually a Microsoft employee. I'm actually a Wolfgang Puck temp Okay. Okay, excellent. Um, it's very interesting. <laughs> what, uh, I've a lot of stuff I can't tell myself. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, but uh, maybe just uh, briefly tell us, so so what what attracts you to actually want to contribute to this work? Like what, anything in specific that you're interested um, in or so you find potential in? That I I've, I've been a farmer. I okay. farm goats and vegetables and children in Alaska. Uh-huh. I, I wasn't market farming. Um, right. And it's a bit of personal use. And um, I, I, I'm so inarticulate today. I've been like vacillating between not being able to breathe because I'm so excited to be on the project. <laughs> if I'm remembering to breathe, I'm so excited to be on the project. Um, it's the, it's the modularity, the accessibility. Um, um, you know, reinventing the world in a in an abundance mindset. Yeah. You know, that. Yeah. Yeah, awesome. Yeah, so that's that's what we'd like I mean, to I have, do. I have to keep loading with everything you've said. Yeah. So I'm going to turn the microphone back off because I'll just keep telling you the same thing. Okay. Yeah, thank you for the input. That's great. So we'll we'll continue. Um, <laughs> we'll continue the discussion over the internet then to to see what your next steps are. But yeah, it'll be great to have you. Um, and it, we talk a lot about it's like you have to have the right mindset to do this. It's not we don't necessarily yeah. look at skill set, but it's mindset where people are willing to learn new things and get involved. A lot of the open source kind of uh, post scarcity thinking is pretty important because otherwise people just don't really find a purpose of why are, why are we doing this. So that's good. Okay. I completely understand why you're doing it. Yeah. Completely. Yeah. Excellent. Excellent. Okay. Um, Excellent. So let's move on. So out of the people, uh, Josh, Josh, you're on there. Do you have any um, anything to pump in today? Uh, yeah, can you hear me all right? yeah, we can hear you. Yeah. So not not ton new stuff. Well, I guess maybe some. I spoke to Alex last week. Yeah. Yeah. To, um, get us to have a lot more people working in parallel. And, yeah. Uh, the interesting part as well is, is like the open source tools around CAD. Uh, it, it, they're just not as uh, as as powerful as like most of the industry standards. And so it's kind of just I think what I've had a realization recently is just kind of been uh, like I, I, you know the first workshop I went to is just kind of like well we don't have any CNC ability so we're just going to figure it out we're just going to use the tools we have so 
this, and we have a lot of developing uh, work on this. So we are, uh, you know, you take that, kind of break it down into these sub-modules, and then in there, parts would just be um, components of those modules. Or you could have, have even assemblies in there, right? Um, so I've been just trying to simplify the naming, because one thing that you'll notice is, like, it can be kind of opaque. Um, yep. So I figured... Uh, it's my, my proposed naming convention right now. Uh, that was kind of something I was working on. It's just we would have like a code for yep. each uh, um, project. So, you know, microtrack, MT, and then, you know, at, at each subassembly level, there's a number, and then each part. And parts and subassemblies at that level are kind of treated the same, uh, which I, I think is massively simplifying. So, uh, yeah, I, th I, th I know there's a lot of great work that's been done on, on part naming for, um, for open source psychology. I just thought, I was re doing a little bit more reading on whether you should have like intelligent part naming or uh, simplified uh, part naming. And, yeah. Yeah, uh, definitely we could use some uh, standardization. I think we, at some point, um, 17 or 4 yeah like yeah like there's links for example on the naming and identification part there is a few little things I think we at one point we tried to get a three letter code for every single machine that's somewhere on the wiki so I think you can definitely build on that or just integrate that uh, I see your uh, the page you just did OSC part naming convention that's good that's good to get to get uh, settled on it um, maybe like two or three, two or three letter, like MT, 3DP, yeah, yeah, yeah it's... Yeah, it's, and you see, the, the reasoning behind that is that, uh, I was reading a little bit more about the kind of intelligent part naming, or mm -hmm. kind of just generic parts, and I think that for us, what matters is that it fits into some sort of place in this product ecology, so you're always going to be working on something within the context of the micro track or something else and I, I'm still very open to like you know we've got these piping libraries right mm -hmm. um, you know or a bunch of other standard parts I think it's totally fine to have those but I think it would be nice as far as a bill of materials goes to have things be kind of function agnostic on um, when you're building up these assemblies and so you just open up a part and it's you know micro track it's got six sub-assemblies and each, you know, of those have X number of parts and then you don't end up with something that's trying to be used too many different places uh, um, because these can be tweaked and then you're, you're updating something else in a different place. Uh, so, yeah, it, it, it's something, it's, it's a complicated workflow and it's, it's complicated enough when you have, like, like you were talking about with the continuity of uh, um, issues. It's complicated complicated enough when you have a like business that's been running for years yeah and let alone having a bunch of people hopping on all the time and naming things new but you know you just end up with the problem of like uh bracket and there's there's a hundred different parts you need to bracket use yeah. 30 different projects so um i just think kind of taking out the the function from the part name besides what the, it is used in the master assembly matters. And so one concern is, uh, I was thinking about this, is actually in the micro track, we've got the power cube in there, right? Mm -hmm. So um, I, I was thinking we would just pull that in, that would be named, you know, I didn't put that on the, the table there, but it would be named, you know, PC something, or, you know, I haven't figured out that there. And so you would just pull that into the micro track, and because that's already a full functioning kind of master concept thing. Uh, that would live in there, live in the micro track as under uh, a sub assembly or something. So there's there's some tweaks there, and some of it doesn't matter too much because as long as it functions well. But mm -hmm. um, yeah, just just trying to play with that while I'm rebuilding, uh, building up the micro tractor and making these these uh, changes. So yeah, that makes makes a lot of sense. And just to add to that, the thought I had a lot of times is like, because we were based on module-based design, 
it's useful to treat everything as a module. So if it becomes convenient, like for example, you have microtrack subassembly one part one. Uh, if there's a well-developed part like subassembly such as the wheel unit or something, maybe that gets its own own two letters like the microtrack. Uh, because when you do like microtrack, that means that's like this unit that we understand. But but it depends. We might want to use that use the call like we call it MT that's a module but also you can call a part a module if you treat it a different way so um, I guess the summary of that kind of doesn't make so much sense but but the summary of that is is if we treat everything as a module that we can then we can possibly use the letters uh, up front so that like the code doesn't become too too tricky like too many numbers in the code that that a person a rational person cannot like interpret that easily enough so so i would i would encourage too if we if we want to make other modules that are already modules in microtrack as their own kind of uh development projects that's a that's well acceptable because that would allow a person to take that module and then have a whole development process around that not only on a microtrack but also at the sub module level so yeah that's i mean it's a complex topic and I mean, what we do know is that, you know, we've got 50, 50 machines, there's um, sub-modules of those machines. So the thing that we definitely want to do for, for like the duration of the project is to, okay, first of all, we're clear on a 50 machines and then break down those machines into the modules so that there's no ambiguity on when a person works on something what is the naming convention well we've already done that quite a bit in the past i can tell you like there's a i think there's a page that is called module list right so this this it's called gvcs modules or modules list where for every single machine we've already done some work to say okay these are the modules it's made of so that you definitely want to add the GVCS modules list. Uh, call it module list to the OSC part naming convention. I'll put that in the link right now. Um, I'll just put that as one. That's definitely something we've thought about before. And there might be some changes based on what we know right now as just little refinements here and there. But, you know, for example, for the CEB press, you know that you've got the hopper, you've got the arms. You've got the press, foot, etc. So a lot of that work has already been defined in the modules list, just for your reference. Yep. Mm -hmm. Cool. Yeah, so we'll, uh, we'll keep playing with that. Yeah. Uh, it's something to develop. And yeah, that's kind of where I'm at right now. It's just working on the microtractor. So get a build happening in August. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So did you start any on a CAD yet, or you didn't touch that yet? Uh, yes, I have started on the CAD, um, and a lot of that is really collecting parts because there's the master CAD um, uh, out there, and I'm trying to get things together so that you don't have to go full 45 parts, uh, because right now you can work on one part, then that's just a component that you can't edit very well mm -hmm. within something else. So, yeah, that's, that's kind of motivating this. This, yep. Uh, current project right now. So, yep. Yep. Um, and a question yeah. I had this one question like for example, okay, so I'm looking at Microtrack CAD and parts. What happens when okay, we click on one of the parts, it goes uh you know, say I'm in one part. What happens when somebody downloads that one part? Can they do that or do they have to download the whole repo like to make a pull request? Oh, you can download just one part for sure. Okay, so um, you can yeah. say you download one Absolutely part. Possible. Say you accept it into the, you accept the pull request. Then, d what happens to the old file? It, so this is this is where the issues with um, with non-binary files comes in. Which, yeah. Which is Lex has talked a lot about this, but right. Um, merges don't work well, right? Um, this, I think, in a lot of ways, GitHub, you know, this, this repo I see more as people can go grab everything okay. and then start working. But yep. it's not like you can, right now, I mean, 
the way a lot of the engineering development works is it's not like you can just say, hey, start working on this part. Like, you have to kind of understand yeah. the entire project. Right. You have to know what this part's going to do and how it's going to interact with other parts. So yeah. I see this as more of like, I'm just imagining someone, you know, in Arizona, uh, you know, wants to get all these parts, right? Yeah. So it, it, it's hard to find on the wiki. And uh, GitHub's a much more approachable yep. place to just go, oh, yeah, just go down. You can either download it all as a zip or you can then, you know, go on this repo and start working on it, uh, which, you know, they can decide to fork if they'd like, which hopefully, you know, that, mm -hmm. that's part of the open source cultures. You want that, right? You want as many of these things to be replicated. And yep. Interested. So you can also in these readmeets, yeah, like you're showing, link to the wiki, which I see that as being like where the information is. Yep. Still as far as uh, kind of tracking some parts through history and collecting them. The, the folder structure, I think, can be maintained a little bit better on GitHub. Mm -hmm. And again, everything is like, there's not a perfect tool for anything. Right. Um, but, you know, as long as it can get us going and keep us going faster. For me, a, a reason I put it on there is just, I want to have a spot where I can just say, you know, uh, go, go download all the parts and then check in and see whether they're working. And yeah. Right. Okay. Um, and just to finish the topic of the pull request, which is which is not really set up for files like FreeCAD. So what happens if somebody, say, downloads a part, makes a desirable change? What do you do then? You take that and just upload it yourself, just manually, if you like the part? Uh, I think at this moment... Uh... you know, everything else can still happen the way it happens on the wiki. Uh, and then we can see how this sort of develops. So, yeah. short answer is, I'm not exactly sure how this is going to play out. Right. Um, yeah, just just trying to make it easier for, for people outside of the project to grab things. Yep. Um, and then inside the project to also get started and get going. Right. And what is your process that you do? Like, say you're working on a file and then you make changes, you work on it, you do the next change. Uh, are you going to upload it over that existing one, or, or that's something you're still going to work out? You might create a new repository. Yeah, that's something that uh, we kind of need to work out. So, yeah. Um, you know, that's where PLM software is helpful. Right. Um, like in a lot of companies, what you'll do is, is you'll check a part out, so you can basically, like, while someone is working on this part, yep. that's basically the way it's, like, you just can't work on it, right? So this hard, so the person has this part that's already going on, it's, you can't work on it because it's locked down. So uh, it's kind of a, a simpler way to block it, and I think that's what Lex's approach with uh, yeah. the yep. demo bench was. Um, yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay, that sounds good to me. So yeah. Uh, so yeah, and there's something else. Just something else for everyone to keep in mind about the part naming thing is, I think there's. I think uh, Abe just had a comment over here. Not sure if it shows up in the video about, um, you know, naming parts. Uh, the other approach we could take is just say, you know, no naming information matters, and you can just give each part um, just a random kind of sequence of numbers or letters, right? And then you just maintain a master spreadsheet. And then every time there's a change or something's not backwards compatible, you just add it to the part. Um, so that's another kind of approach. But I think it's it's difficult, as opposed to a variable in programming, where it's like this does something and you store one thing here. A part that just has so much more stuff inside of it. And it's very hard to give any sort of knowledge about how a pulley functions or, you know, like how much information do you give? Do you give the size? Well, what if the size changes in that part? You know, it's, it's a, uh, I think that's the, the challenge with naming too in depth. So there's, there's a balance here to be struck. It's not going to be solved overnight. And, 
Yeah. Yeah. Just love comments. Yep. And I see Abe's question because FreeCAD must be open XML, how easy may it be able to adopt repos to work better with FreeCAD files? Lex or Josh, do you guys know that answer? Any thoughts on that? Yeah, there was some, there was some discussion about this on the uh, FreeCAD mailing list. Yeah. And basically, one advantage of doing, uh, of unzipping, because FreeCAD files are just a zip file, right, with XML inside. Yeah. So one advantage of unzipping it and storing the XML in GitHub is that you at least get uh, diffs, you know, between files that are human readable. It's XML, but it's human readable. Uh huh. Uh, but you still get, but it'll still cooperate if you work because when GitHub is doing the diff, it doesn't actually know where one tag begins and one ends. So it will easily, uh, if you merge two files, two XML files, it will easily put like double end tags or, or two start tags where they don't go, and so you'll still get corrupt. Uh huh. Uh huh. And is there any um, anything on a map where somebody's trying to address this for FreeCAD on GitHub? I think what I remember them saying is that there are actually tools for doing diffing of XML. So, if, so on a, on your desktop, you can uh, you know if you're trying to do the merge, resolve a merge, you can actually open tools. And basically, what those tools do is they work with the Git tool to make sure that when you merge them, that you end up with correct closing and opening tags. Um, so that, that will make sure that at least the XML is correct after the merge, but it, but it won't make sure that uh, the, the, uh, like the logically that it's correct. Right? Like you may end up with uh, a point inside of a point or something like that. Um, uh -huh. Fail in FreeCAD, but it would be correct XML. So there's multiple layers uh, that you have to make sure that after a merge that things are correct. Uh, currently, as far as I know, there's no tools to do that. Uh-huh. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and Lex, do you think that? It's just a complicated problem. So yeah, yeah. No, it's, it's not just us struggling with this. There's a lot of other people that, that fight this as well. Right. And Lex's uh, workbench for FreeCAD, OC Dev workbench on FreeCAD. They'll address the basic check in and out, and that, and in that, Lex, how are you? Are you storing the files on GitHub or no? You're just using no. You're just using OSC Dev, right? Uh, I plan to store them on Amazon. Uh, right. Because uh, I figured, I calculated that there would be a lot of data because every time you save, we're actually just making a copy of the file. So. Uh, yeah. Uh huh. Okay. Yep. Especially they have this feature where you can uh, archive things, so they're still accessible, but they're not as fast, so we can use them with like older files that don't need to be accessible and stuff. So. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that sounds good. Okay. Um, let's move on then. So, so Lex, um, tell me where you are, and you said you're working on setting up workshop. Yeah, I'm getting my tools. So I, I bought a bunch of tools, and I started working at, at my house here. But it's kind of I don't really have a good place to work, so I'm, uh, I'm working with my neighbor uh, to set up a workshop where we can do welding and all that stuff. So. Uh huh. Yeah. Are you um? Are you? Do you have any time to return back to the OSC Dev Workbench there, or where yeah, are you I, prioritizing? I've been thinking about that, that as well. I mean, I'm I'm, uh, I'm planning to get back into it a lot more. Uh, currently, I'm like really busy at work. Yeah. So, Okay. No, no good news, but no bad news either. Okay. It's, it's, it's coming. All right. Okay. Let's keep going then. Okay, Ruslan, do you want to uh, continue? Ruslan, are you there? Or you can't hear? Or? Because we're not hearing you. 
Now we can hear you, but talk a little louder. Is it better now? Yes, that works. Is it better? Even better. Okay. Uh, to write an abstract and then I will continue. Yes. So Yes, yeah, so so the idea here is that uh, fortunately we have some people on a team that are actually starting to write like like Ruslan writing um, workbenches which actually Steven has started the first one on a D3D printer but the idea is that for every project that we do we have our design workbench within FreeCAD as kind of like the standard product that OSE puts out there. So we have our part libraries within FreeCAD and dedicated workbenches which simply facilitate the design. That means we make it faster, easier, uh, more automated to do a design. Like say you want to do a modification of the 3D printer or the CEB press or the tractor, you can click buttons and parts will appear and you can arrange them, you can scale them. So the, the idea of being able to create new workbenches on demand is going to be more important as we go forward because we'd like to have that for just about every every project that we do to facilitate design. Uh, so I asked Ruslan to to document the process of how do you actually go into FreeCAD to start programming a workbench in FreeCAD and that builds on a small video that that Steven has already done and he's taken that further so that we can actually teach people like if, if anybody who's got any programming skill on a, on a team we can teach them rapidly how to work on new workbenches or continue former work so Ruslan with that said what is new to that? What do you have to add to that? Okay. Uh, you asked me to write an abstract. Yes so yeah we started with a simple abstract defining okay here's oh, but just basically starting to that process of documenting how you um, how you create workbenches. So we're starting to work on it, and it's something we'd like to teach to to our people. I mean, I'd definitely like to learn more about that myself, and I'm sure some of you may also want to learn more about that. I, I suppose uh, uh, that uh, for me it was like we tried to adopt some uh, different documentation techniques. Yep. Uh, from from my side, it was, it was uh, more from scientific, uh, from research papers. Yeah. And uh, there is some kind of um, uh, different approaches how to read documentation, how to write documentation. In my case, as a scientist, uh, read papers and write papers. Yeah. Um, uh, now it was a little abstract. Typical for scientific papers, and uh, I see them as uh, not only as, uh, the idea, the main idea is to look at the abstract and to determine if you want, if you need to continue, if it's uh, if it, uh, the text or the video is something which you need. Uh, if I understood you correctly. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and then, okay, I, I tried to. It, it was a, li a little bit strange, or not a little bit. It was pretty strange to use a particular approach for scientific papers for YouTube video. <laughs> but, uh, okay, I tried it. It uh, also helped me. Yeah, but, uh, well, there's no problem with. with adding an abstract to a YouTube video, it's, it's essentially a summary, yeah. So I think we're going to upgrade the standards of YouTube. <laughs> um, I, I, I'm not sure if uh, YouTube videos are made in such a way that people, that uh, you can recognize if it's useful or not. Probably the completely opposite, uh, to, to make it, to put as much as Uh huh. So, some dramatic titles, and you, we uh, we do it in completely opposite way. You look at the text or at the description, and you should decide if it's something useful for you or, or not. This is uh, the way how uh, people often will look for particular papers. Reading scientific papers are hard, at least in my in my area in mathematics. 
I'm struck and uh, make a decision. Um, okay, uh, I made an abstract and uh, wrote some uh, uh, some comments about the process of making, of abstract making, or summary making. Maybe it could be useful um, for other team members. Um, Is that on your log? Okay. Uh, I, I put some comments. Yeah, on writing well, I've heard of that book. That's a, that's a, I'm hearing it again, so it must be a decent book. But yeah, definitely it's useful to be able to just follow basic procedures and rules of how to write. Yeah. Yes, uh, I think uh, a lot of uh, things like teaching and writing something uh, magical, uh, something magical that only talent, uh, some very talented people can do. Right. So often just a list of, uh, of rules, uh, and if a person knows this list and cares, which is also important, think about the reader and care for the reader, then I suppose that you can get a decent result. Yeah, uh, I agree with that. It's uh, uh, writing is also. I mean, there's definitely rules for how to do that, like for many things. So, I definitely agree with that. That, that many many things can be taught. It's not. I mean, I really am a fan of saying that it's. It's not nature, versus nurture. Like nurture is very important, just like we say that mindset is more important than skill set because the mindset allows you to learn so you can learn a lot of different things that people typically like to kind of miss i see a lot of this mystification like when someone's good at something they a lot of times don't tell others how they do that uh, so that they can maintain their their military superiority <laughs> uh, but in the culture of open source, we definitely want to expose how things are done, and I think learning to write is a great case point of just like everything that we do. I think many many things can be taught. Um, Possibly there was some interesting citation from Bertrand Russell. Uh, if I uh -huh. remember. Bertrand Russell, correctly, yes. Correctly, uh, maybe it fits well about this magical stuff. Some exclusive knowledge. Yeah. The scientists, they have some, uh, there is some kind of similarity between scientists today and priests uh, mm. thousands of years ago. Mm. It is, uh, it's all about special knowledge. But uh, scientists uh, uh, lost their power when, uh, when the education became more accessible. There are some. Scientists, priests, magic, huh. information. So and, both uh, priests and scientists lost their power when education becomes more available. Yep. Are you, uh, are, is anyone here familiar with Friedrich Hayek? Yeah. What was Hayek? Is his last name? He's a really interesting economist that
And so Hayek actually calls for the distribution of that knowledge? Uh, he's basically arguing uh, in the stuff I've read that, uh, that we are not uh, understanding as much that there's a lot of power in, in the knowledge that these people um, below have, right? Like uh, we're not seeing that there's a lot of distributed knowledge. Oh. Yeah, and that's what. Yeah, and a trick to open source is trying to extract that knowledge, make it more accessible. So scalable processes for doing that, that's what we're trying to develop. That's good. Are you saying that you also have to remind yourself or force yourself that you should care about documentation because people are going to read it? Like you, you want to try to respect the reader? Did you have that care already or is it something you have to develop? Uh, what do you mean? Well, is, was that... Was that a learning for you, or that you, you're you're already coming to the show with that, and you're you're encouraging others to care for the reader? Yeah. But, but yeah. Uh, there are a lot of uh, obvious stuff which are not obvious when, when you. Uh, which are not all obvious. Right, right. Yeah, I think um, 
yeah, we should make it very clear to our, our people that uh, just the importance of documentation and caring for the reader. Yeah, it's definitely something that we want to communicate and do and also help our people understand how important that is. Because I, I do see that a lot of people don't appreciate it enough, definitely. So... Right. Time, yeah. time is important and uh, definitely. Time, time is important and good mood is also important. Yeah, we have to have fun. That's uh, that's what Richard Branson says, right? Okay. Uh, given um, so on time, respecting people's time, uh, I do remind everybody then, like on the OSC Dev Team agenda, like especially as we get more people on a team. Please do write, like, before the meeting, write down, like, what, how many minutes. Just just put yourself on an agenda and the amount of minutes you'd like to speak and about what topic. So we can gauge the meeting for what we can fit. And if we have, like, for example, in the future, if we have too many people, we just have to limit people to a certain amount of time. And that's a, that's a way to help organize the, the meeting as we get more contributions. So we got to think about scaling that. Okay. Okay. Uh, To, to spank you? No, uh, that was to everybody uh, because that's that's a good lead in to because I noticed not, nobody really did that for this meeting. So for future meetings, just please remember that's to everyone that uh, you want to put your what you have. So we're, you're on a schedule and the meeting is just better organized. So the first item number one agenda, page one of each development meeting agenda document. Um, yeah. But okay, so let's let's move on to Abe. Unless uh, Ruslan, do you, anything else that you wanted to say, or is that does that cover for you? I will use your time. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, thank you. So, uh, Abe, do you have? Um, please uh, go on then, Abe. I see you put in ten minutes. All right. Hey, but you there? Can you uh, speak up? Abe, are you still there? I think Abe disappeared on us. No, Abe, we cannot hear you. Now we can.
the ball from the cat, but um, I think it's the, with the ability to generate parts and things like that, possibly for the, a lot of the plumbing here, which is mostly what's left, it could be easier to get all the plumbing, a list of the plumbing first in like the spreadsheet, and then it, of course it would be great if there was a way to just import that, which I think is kind of how um, kind of how Rosanna has the the uh, the plumbing parts, you know, being generated in the uh, in that workbench. So I was thinking of trying to figure out how to test uh, uh, a way to get a list of parts and see how that could be just imported and generated in FreeCAD. Uh, right. So, hey, let, let me a, let me ask you. Let me just interrupt you for a second there. So, on FreeCAD, have you tried to organize the tree such that you can then there is a, a spreadsheet function or like a list function within FreeCAD. Would that work to basically um, list through the through the part tree? Well, I think that's a that's an output. I think there's a, a sp oh well, th th there's a spreadsheet function in FreeCAD. Actually, yeah. that reminds me of something else. Um, but but yeah, so the tree. I'm not sure how that well that integrates with the. Uh, spreadsheet workbench because I really haven't used that spreadsheet workbench. I'm gonna pull that up. But I was sort of thinking the way the uh, we need better integration in the tools and um, actually the, just because a lot of the testing on this stuff is like we were talking about the naming conventions earlier. There's a lot of metadata and stuff that gets copied around and like I'm trying to straighten up the. There's a lot more changes to the build materials kind of than I thought before after I'm going through it because like I'm listed here in see our team meeting document uh, I'm changing for instance the the chrome plated I think uh, uh, parts they're like three quarter inch nipples for the tank wall but I think we're changing those to black iron pipe because that's what that's what we discussed before and it's listed yeah. on the uh, on the wiki on the yeah. concept uh, concept page so th those will rust but I think we can you know use simpler parts for that if they don't need to be plated um, so I've got to change a lot of that there were a lot of T's and other things listed in the build materials that I don't think we use anywhere I, okay so that's right there's, there's a lot of stuff to change out there and I'm trying to figure out what what that is and of course there's the visual bomb which also has a lot of stuff but it also doesn't have a lot of things. I, I basically was trying to copy over, I think I discussed this before, the files from 7.11 and, and figure out the differences. And we have a lot of layers to change if we have to update on these files, but it's, it's unfortunate with the, the Office Suite that there isn't more like easier ways to embed and link to, to the information. Because usually the Office Suite software is Designed so that you can link information from one file to another, and then you don't have to do so much uh, copying and pasting or just re-entering data all the time. That's kind of said earlier. If we could just enter metadata in one place, and then it would propagate through uh, software tools, you, that would certainly simplify things. Um, but uh, I, I think there's a lot of opportunity there for, for some of these workbenches and software even a website. Um, so, let's see. Um, I don't think I have any questions in particular about the plumbing parts, because I think I'm just going with the black iron pipe on those, and I just have to make sure they fit through the tank wall. Um, my only concern there is that before we were using those hex um, nipples that were like, they have a, uh, a hex so you can put a wrench on them, and then yep. the threads would only stick so far through because of the you know, there's a quarter inch, but I had to figure out the length of the nipple because if we just use a straight nipple, there's no, um, because, because we're welding. Right. If we cut them in half and we're welding that one part on the inside, oh, uh, okay, so once it's welded then I guess you can thread the, uh, the ball valve on the outside part, okay. So yeah. I, I was thinking maybe of the ones... Let's see, the ones that tighten down through the into the elbows that are welded on the inside, those need to be long enough they reach th 
through and thread well, so that because MPT knows that tapered thread, and they just don't want it to have any possible leaks. I don't know if you've been. Using well, this that. is uh, on the inside. Uh, just one comment on the inside. Uh, you don't care about small leaks. I mean, the inside could be welded and not necessarily threaded. Well, no, I mean, it's easier to thread it. But uh, at that point, you'd have... Yeah, it's easier to thread it. You mean thread the wall? I was thinking about threading the, the tank wall itself. Do you want to tap it? No, I no, don't, don't want to tap it. That Those holes are too big. That's, That's a little, little difficult to tap. Yeah, you've um, got to have more holes. You've got to have a large tap. you got to bore it to the right size after you see it, see so cut it. Yeah. yeah, no, forget about that. We weld in a pipe... We thread in the rest. Weld the elbow and then thread the nipple into the elbow through the tank wall itself. So yeah. the issue there is the the nipple doesn't have if it doesn't have a hex on there so that it can thread through the wall because that that hex uh, you won't be able to get a wrench on there easily depending on the length of that nipple without um uh, uh there's different ways to do that but that trying to think about the process there because you could put something else on the nipple then thread that all together I guess so yeah you could use the ball valve to tighten down the whole uh, three piece three pieces together well once it's I don't know if you use the Teflon tape to prevent leaks in the pipe or not but yeah okay the process is for manufacturability you have to put on the elbow and the pipe and stick it through the hole and then weld it in that's all that will be the process so you build you your the elbows inside first. I saw that from the photos, and then so the piece that threads through the wall, you have to be able to tighten that nipple down into the elbow after it's welded. Uh, well, look, what I would do for the simplest case, we weld. So we make the whole assembly in the back, like I'm showing on a screen. So you weld. You uh, connect the, the straight pipe to the elbow, and then you th you thread in the pipe. And you don't have to worry about perfect tightening here because that's inside the hydraulic reservoir. You don't care if you have got just a little dribble. Yeah. You're, you're under fluid. But on the outside, as soon as you put it in, you weld it in. And that, that fit there has to be leak tight. And we can fix it up with like JB Weld if there's a little leak. But yeah, the outside has to be welded okay. well. Mm -hmm. So in the CAD right now, we have those, what are those? Half hex. Things. So up there, there's those half-inch hex nipples, which I think were from the original bomb. Um, they're those chrome-plated parts, and I don't know that we're going to keep using those. It's not like the idea was to use just black out, which we listed on the, uh, on the uh, concept page for the wiki, is black iron pipe. Um, yeah, I think we want to do on the ball valves because it doesn't it doesn't need to be rust resistant necessarily right, right? it'll be a, so that's cheaper um let's see up there it doesn't need to be a whole nipple so you need to be able to thread that nipple in either prior i guess you could do it as long as it fits through and then weld the whole thing in right all three pieces that's yeah do that and then let's see and then there's quick adapters on those okay so i still gotta for the quick adapters. Now down below on the suction lines, it was more like you take some length of nipple and maybe cut it in half, which creates an extra step. And those are three quarter inch, so like half of a, a two to three inch nipple cut in half, and then you thread the ball valve on after it's welded to right. the, uh, the inside of the tank. So I, I've got to adjust some of those parts. I was just trying to get the list of parts right. correct from the bottom so I can get it right in the CAD. Yep. And the numbers and parts and all that because I, I know these ball valves are actually the wrong size of the CAD and things like that. So, and then there's some SAE adapter parts to MBT on the pump and stuff. I've got to get in there. So, uh, the bomb was not matching up. So, I'm trying to, trying to make sure I get all the parts listed correctly before I kind of try to actually draw some of those in the CAD so I don't make any more. Spend more time drawing stuff in the CAD that. It's not right, but um, the I'm hoping too that it can generate it. As I said, it'll be easier to generate parts possibly from from a plumbing workbench and be good to work on that. Um, that way, it's more like the CAD. In a lot of cases, can just be freaking be easy.
easier. It's less drawing, and more just like generate some of these parts from a workbench, and then just assemble them. Right. Uh, we have less drawing that way, so it's less of a learning curve. Uh, well, I mean, according to what you're saying, we should have a free CAD workbench for power cubes where you just drag and drop the standard parts and you can change perhaps some of those sizes like you say you need a half inch nipple versus three quarter inch nipple or whatever but absolutely that would facilitate the whole design process because you don't really have to think about what parts you're going to use you we we have a design guide that says okay use these these specific parts yeah so so that's that would be the beauty of creating the power cube construction set in FreeCAD, the workbench, and uh, you know we'll see yeah. when we can do that. Individual workbenches for different machines is an issue way to do it, but it seems like if we have a the broader issue overall is, is having a tool chain that we don't have to spend a lot of time constantly copying information and updating layers of, yeah. of files. Um, I pasted the link to, to Revolver again. In the right. Slide. I was looking back at that because there was some discussion about uh, websites, all these, these tool workbenches and things like that. Yeah. Revolver looks to me like an attempt to create a closed source website. And I think Revolver 2, the version is they're trying to add control functionality. That's what it says. So right. That seems like what we need is an open source interface that allows collaborative engineering projects online. I mean, that, that's kind of the, the thing that would make it easy having a complete two chain, tool chain with all open source apps and just being able to uh, have people more easily collaborate to make any project they want. That's what I was going to say. Because then you can get, it'll be easier for more people to work on machines. I mean, a lot of the stuff that we're working with should be open source. Uh, yeah. We're using Docs, hey, but Docs. okay. What do you think about the idea of so? Say we create some templates on the wiki where they're formatted well, and uh, you can pull down all the parts from there. I mean, what do you think is the limit of simple wiki templates? Because you can program a nice, very nice template. I mean, the the wiki allows HTML and CSS. You can format like really nice interfaces within the wiki if someone actually took the effort to do that yeah i think that the web uh, interface Jesus has a lot of potential so um i'm not immediately familiar with css although i've looked some more recently at learning some of that so um the, there's a lot of potential to do that style and formatting get the look of things better um a lot of it is, we use a whole bunch of different apps, and that's always been the case. Uh, we've tried, you know, all kinds of different web portals for this, that, and the other, and it's getting that integrated so everything works well together. Um, and the more we can do in one place, the better I think it'll, the easier it'll be. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, the, of course, we've been doing these burn downs, and that, that seems like there's pros, I think, to that. And of course, you can generate charts in the spreadsheets as well. I've noticed, I think you've been adding, I've been using the short template, development template, and I think I've noticed you, you're occasionally editing that template, and it actually, it's actually, it's simple on the short one that we've just been editing uh, for the list of, of items uh, that goes on the main for the, like the power cube, but I know there's a whole bunch of other sheets in there with lots of other potential data to be filled out. Yes, there is. So they're they're not completed. Changing that, so it's not, in that sense, it's not a very short form template. Uh, there's a whole bunch more. No, there's more. There's more. We can treat it one at a time and we can separate them. I would, I mean, I would actually suggest that we just do a template within the wiki and then you can parse within the wiki, so we don't even have to go to go to Google Docs, because they're just. Uh, I mean, for the long term, they're definitely a vulnerability. You don't know, like in ten years, that well, those things will be available. Yeah, the Google documents. I think we're using those because they're collaborative, but they right. are supposed to be an open document format, and that should always be some extent compatible. And these office suites 
office like right. that, LibreOffice, OpenOffice, whatever, are supposed to be office suites have always been designed so that data can be moved between the different file formats, spreadsheets, yeah. reports, that kind of stuff. And we shouldn't have to we should be able to do it so that we don't have to constantly copy data, including within the spreadsheets. Uh, every spreadsheet needs to be more if there's a sheet that relies on the data from another sheet, it needs to be linked together more so that we're not having to constantly fill out lots of data. Ideal if data can be in one place and lots of report information can be generated from that. Uh, some of that is just the design workflow, but it, I think web interfaces do help that too, so I don't know. There's got to be a lot of software APIs. To me, it looks like it almost like we need more people coding than anything still. <laughs> yeah. Because if the platform was smoother, then it'd be easier for a lot more people that don't know how to use some of these tools to come in and, and more work and I think more people would be interested. Uh, that's true. There's a, one danger to that, which is that if we encode, spend a lot of time coding something and then the methods change, which is like we're still developing both the methods and everything else. Like if, if the methods change, then you're kind of stuck with an outdated uh, development protocol kind of deal. So, um, yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Different versions of, of software and yeah. things like that. So it's a... Yeah, it's... We need more people. But I want to draw your attention to, there's a page on the wiki, if you look at my screen, it's called Flashy XM. Uh, but that page there, that just shows you an example of what you can do. That's that's HTML, CSS, so you can do pretty much, you can format the wiki and embed anything in there. Like right on that page, we've got videos, we've got a map of contributors, supposedly a, a presentation, spreadsheets, the scrummy, and a bunch of stuff in there. So, I mean, we can format the wiki like however we like. It just takes programming yeah. to do it. CSS is very, uh, my understanding is very interactive now. Um, I'm not even right. sure you need less secure stuff like JavaScript and things like that. Uh -huh. You can do menus. Menus and interactive graphics is my understanding huh. with just pure CSS to yeah. some extent. No, I uh, think, I mean, I've always been of the opinion like, we know that the largest, most successful collaborative project in the world uses a wiki. That's Wikipedia. I mean, we got to just do that. We do that with various types of templates. You can add semantic media wiki on top of that. Uh, I think there's a lot of power just to the very basic tools. HTML, CSS, wiki. We don't necessarily even have to go to the, the collaborative uh, Google Docs. Uh, we're kind of waiting for an open source version of the collaborative to, to get really good. There's some out there already, but I'm not sure they're developed well enough at this point. LibreOffice, yeah. Which are cloud collaborative, like more than LibreOffice, unless LibreOffice has one yeah, that's a cloud collaborative one. We talked about before. I think it has to run on, like, the OSE server or something, though. So well, yeah, it would have to be server-based and all that. In the cloud somewhere. Right. Which I, if I understand correctly, currently the OSE server is not a, it, it's a central server, it's not all in the cloud, um, kind of more virtualized or something, but, yeah, it's, it's isn't necessary at this point. Yeah, okay, um, but as far as, uh, do you, as the PowerCube and the BOM material there, do you want to try to just strip your file, like maybe you have like a, BOM dedicated file so you strip all the constraints maybe and just organize a nice tree view you think that would work for as an experiment for generating a BOM right out of FreeCAD um, that, that could be and I don't know how um, there should be ways to do all kinds of stuff within FreeCAD to take the names look at the metadata uh, maybe some type of plugin yeah. Export because it, clearly it can export. Um, oh yeah. Well, yeah. There's a way to export spreadsheets or at least CSV. Um, and it can import in CSV too for uh, the pipe workbench. So there's ways that it can be moved in and out. Yeah. Um, and the key to that would be though that uh, it's really about a lot of work within the tree view itself that means carefully labeling every single part in the most transparent way possible like for example you've got all these nips 
So you could call it return nip one yeah. or left return nip middle etc and so forth and and then you can just export all of that and of course that would be very useful to have like a bom workbench and i don't know how far uh, freecat is on the, any bom workbench but that would certainly be i think the closest to that is of course the the spreadsheet the what is yeah. that called the spreadsheet workbench um yes. spreadsheet yeah right there spreadsheet workbench yep um, yeah. But yeah, definitely, uh, like you said, uh, some programming, we need some programmers. I mean, that would be the thing to do, just to get somebody to program that and make it work. Yeah. Yeah, I'm going to look at some more of that when I have the time, but uh, so far I haven't uh, really taken a bunch of time to learn more Python or anything like that, so um, there's yeah. a whole lot to that. So. Yeah, uh, generating bomb would, would help. Um, although sometimes we really need the bomb. There's pros and cuts in different ways. You, you having a bomb and then being able to just load the parts into FreeCAD and then assemble them all is, is kind of an interesting way. The opposite. The opposite of that. Well, yeah. that would be definitely very interesting and useful. I mean, once again, that's just... Things that wait for us um, I, in FreeCAD programming. That's, yeah. That's almost doable because the pipe work bench takes the CSV plumbing parts, and if um, yeah, it was adapted so we could just have a list of plumbing parts, import all of them. Yeah. Uh, the CSV from a spreadsheet, you can export that. Uh, it generate all the parts, and then you just start assembling them and load them into other files in FreeCAD or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. That would be very interesting that you can actually interact with just a plain list like off the wiki. Imagine that, man. And see, that's why we love the open source software because we can do that. Eventually, we'll be able to do all of that. Yeah. The uh, issue with the, um, the constraints in organizing the tree view and FreeCAD, I haven't done a lot of, uh, I think I put some folders in there to organize, but the only issue I have with that is the constraints the way it generates those and the parts they're kind of together and so I've, I've been trying to de been clear to separate everything out into different folders because um, it, it's complicated which how the constraints go with the different parts and all that because you're constraining two parts together obviously and <clears throat> sometimes it's hard to make sense out of that uh, dumping all the constraints into one folder okay as long as they're labeled really well but sometimes the gener generated labels are good sometimes they're a little bit more confusing so I end up going back and doing a lot of renaming on that so I don't know how much improvement can be done and free oh uh, that reminds me uh, I don't know I don't think anybody's mentioned that free CAD uh, up to version number they're at 18 um, uh, well um, the official version now 0.17. Okay. And uh, daily is 0.8. Yep. So uh, they, they pushed that uh, the updates uh, the other week ago on yeah. the machine. And That's great. I, I'm hoping there's no issues. I don't think we have any issues with that. Uh, the version must be stable, so relatively stable. So. Yep. All right. Okay, uh, so just a couple more comments. Looking at your um, your CAD here, um, there's a few details like like all the bolts that should end up being in there so that you can get the complete accurate part list off your CAD. Like, for example, the bolt the bolts for the engine mount. Uh, where is that? It disappeared on me somewhere. Yeah, the, the bolts need to go through. Yeah, engine pump module. Yeah, yeah. Bolts, um, the fittings on a pump, and like the bolts for the bottom, bottom here. Yep. And like, you know, even things like, for example, the, the pipes, the, the tubing, that gets a, a hose clamp 
or one of those yeah one of those hose clamps so that should be also represented you can do a simple thing for that we draw a lot of those adapters yeah i really need to redraw uh, i think that hose as well as the uh, certain other parts that were quite right some of that can be generated i think the plumbing parts but the hose was a little more difficult to draw for some reason but um yeah kind of a lot of small adapting plumbing parts um and i'm not sure adapting parts to figure out how well those can be generated uh, going from SAE to uh, MPT uh, that can be done yeah also, and one more I got another comment here so we have the air intake and you have the cooler in front of it but the cooler is more towards the bottom it should be right in the center of the of that hexagonal part so move it up by like three inches or so, so it gets better flow. And actually, Tom Griffin, he made another comment. If we have the grate here as such, why don't we just have that cut out of the CNC? So we don't have to use a separate grate, which is another piece plus four bolts to hold it. So we'll avoid five okay. parts if we cut the frame, the cut the grate, right out of the this one single frame material yeah, yeah. No, no mesh no so mesh i guess the question is how much um yeah how many holes what, what kind of great yeah and, right um because that's a lot of cutting yeah that's a lot of cutting the grade. yeah uh, i would say maybe like do like four by one inch slits and maybe like the width of the actual material is like half inch so your your grates are like half inch with say one by four inch holes but it doesn't have to be like it only needs to be as tall yeah. as the cooler okay. Okay. so it's only like five inches tall yeah in front of the uh the fan i, I guess yeah i guess the question is how does the airflow yeah, I mean, it's not, yeah, it's not like, we don't have a science to that. Um, yeah, I don't have an idea from just, you know, how much airflow there. Because, obviously, it needs to be all across that cooler. Yeah. Even if airflow is kind of more through, um, from the side, from the engine front there, um, it probably doesn't need to be a lot of air cooled through the fence. Because a lot of air cool cooler could be just from from the environment <laughs> right naturally and of course when you have it forced air then it's just qu quicker heat exchange yeah Any yep uh, do you talk about this grid yep uh, do you need uh, access to, to the part behind the grid from, from, uh, right that's uh, Um, I think right it's harder to access what's behind it uh, the the constraints there are that we have to be able to take the engine out which we can from the side and the other constraints we have we can take out our actual cooler which if we unmount the cooler we can just slip it like straight out the top I think um, I think we have access as is. I, I don't think the. It's a good question. I don't think we will have issues with. Well, or let's make sure we don't. So the way I look at it right now, if, Actually, if we unmount it and slip it straight up, it would come out. No. Looking at it in the cab, you, if you want to pull the engine out the top right now with those uh, hook points on top and stuff like that. That looks like it would be hard to actually pull the engine out. No, I don't it think. Look like you could, I think, but from the side, side. Yeah, it might be an easy thing to do. You have to lift it and push it. I might have to make the, the hole bigger, which I think it can do. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, may, it could be an issue to adjust the size of that just to be able to get it out. Right. Um, yeah. If you take off the pump, you can possibly 
flip the engine 90 degrees so you have that longer length but yeah yeah we have to pay attention to all of that where keep it upright that way nothing is dumping oh yeah well i don't know what no it's yeah there's oil in the engine which and gasoline in the engine but yeah that's the kind of stuff like i i do want all of us to get the capacity where we all have 3d printers and little laser cutters that we can actually prototype this as a small scale model and we can test all those things without guessing but and that's where that photogrammetry comes in we want to make sure that our engine is accurate enough that we're not missing like little corners that are going to be in the way or something um yeah it needs to be measured in the cat thoroughly yeah i, I think uh one thing that also is good to remember i was just listening to a podcast today and, you know as much as we can we got to make things accurate as possible but like i worked on that engine I spend a lot of time on it. Yeah. But, um, and I'm not like being defensive. I actually just think like what I've learned from it is it's very difficult for a lot of these parts to, to find dimensions on um, in the first place. And so, uh, you know, there's something like maybe we haven't bought it or used it before. This engine we have, we can probably measure it. But um, I think this is just where, like, you know, pushing, making things, you know, as many times as we can that yeah right that's one way to do it the other way is uh we do have access to photogrammetry using uh just a phone digital camera and and software oh, to yeah. create a 3d yeah. object of that which we talked about in another meeting that, that? yeah there, that's that's available there's uh uh, look on look photogrammetry on the wiki but that would be something like if we could have all of us be able to do that now the thing is that of course someone would have to uh, what I think for an engine like that you can't have shiny parts because shiny parts don't work well so you probably have to spray paint this thing black and then take a bunch of pictures with diffuse light and then you get pretty nice you can get like really nice CAD models that's probably true. There's a lot of ways to process images. I think you can just about the fastest way to do it, of course, is video is just a series of images, but and you can just you know delete most of the frames. But it, it still takes time to set things up. Yeah, it does. Not. But I was seeing uh, what was it a uh, GTC? This you know the graphics processing in, in some AI applications. Uh, apparently, they were demoing how you could just take t uh, 2D black and white sonogram data and then turn it into a 3D moving heart. I saw this yeah. the other day. So the amount of processing that you can do is that's not necessary. I don't think <laughs> don't need to do a bunch of fancy AI uh, software change to figure out how to process some images for 3D because I don't think we need the detail, but th there should be software tool chains that, that make it easy enough to do without having to have um, a lot of processing. Um, a number of photos or just video is the quickest because you get a bunch of photos and then if there are like the specular highlights and so on all that kind of stuff you should be able to process that out if there's enough frames um, it shouldn't be that hard to, to eliminate the, the ones that create issues with the imaging okay uh, yeah, I mean, there's really no mystery to this. There's a page on the wiki called op Open Source Photogrammetry. There's a program called Call Map, and you can see Joseph Prusa's video on that, how he d goes through that process. It's just that somebody has to do it and go through the process. So first taking the pictures, and then doing the processing and fixing. Because you can get the images readily, but you need a little bit of post-processing, like with Mesh Lab or something, uh, if there's any holes left in the an actual object so it's just a matter of doing it just taking the time to do that yeah, I watched that. It yeah didn't look that bad i mean there was some detailed stuff you have to know in the programs of the software but I, so a lot of that could be automated out too sure sure software. but that's that's the thing it's no. yeah we want to develop that a well-refined tool chain that we can use that we know it works and we get the insights of how to make it work well we got to teach ourselves that and spread that through our developer community. 
Um, but yeah, that's one of the things on our on our plate. Yeah. Yes, ideally, there could be video from just any video of, a, of an object, like the engine. Like, there's video of the engines from the workshops. Maybe it's not that is quality, but if you have enough of that, you should be able to cut it up and process it and just create, generate something. Yeah. Like yeah, I mean, for that, you... Like, yes, the video, we have it, but, I mean, we're definitely missing, like, you know, say from the bottom or, like, you're really going to have to uh, make sure you just have simply all the pictures from all the different angles, which typically in a video you don't because you just maybe, like, go around it, like, laterally, you know, things like that. But, yeah, I mean, it's not, not anything majorly difficult. It just someone has to take the time to do that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, to some degree, the kind of guess guess or estimate some of those things out that are missing sometimes but yeah um, dep depends on how you use the software chain uh, right the stuff that i saw that in video is demoing uh, the heart i mean they, they literally go from 2d black and white all the way to 3d and have like this moving beating volume of the heart that was their demo and it's yeah. ridiculous of course it involves like an enormous amount of ai and yeah huge amounts of Right, but right. That, uh, what we should be able to do a lot with just something simple. Right, right. Okay. Um, yeah, okay. So let's um, think we can wrap up here. Um, so let's, let's kind of wrap up. Uh, so just in closing, I just want to want to bring up like the main main thing is I want to get that program announcement out next week and then spawn the hero X open source micro factory challenge which is a, a way to publicize our stuff so the, the idea there was I was gonna go uh, uh, ask a number of open source projects for to fund that like for example Jeff Mo from Lowell's bot he said he would support it like chip into the actual reward money uh, so do that first and then define the project and, and really focus on getting uh, uh, the clarity that says, okay, we're competing for an industrial grade uh, open source cordless drill that's 3D printed. So not just like some random flyby project, but a high quality uh, drill that we can actually use and it's actually a marketable product. Um, that, I mean, what's the relevance of that? I mean, I think the relevance is some in the sense that can we show that 3D printing is not producing just trinkets, but something that's very, very tangible and very high quality? You know, it will take a lot of time. That's why I want to do like a dedicated Hero X, but that would push forward advertising ourselves for like the development team, for the immersion program and so forth. So I think it's, it's quite connected. And if we can demonstrate that we can build a high quality product, like just just really turn some heads with the quality of that i think that would be very important because I, I just don't see I'm not sure i know of any like 3d printed product that's like really good and really high demand like i i do believe that cordless drill fits that because there's uh the numbers are there's a billion dollars the the cordless drill market in the united states is a billion dollars united states alone i mean it's huge um uh, so uh, it's a definite, very important economic product. It's so, and it's it perfectly lends itself for 3D printing, using some off-the-shelf parts and and a CNC milling of a little circuit or something, possibly getting off-the-shelf motors, off-the-shelf chucks, uh, possibly in later iterations that you know they're they're also made uh, by DIY methods, uh, like the 3D printed uh, motor that this one company has done a 3d printed one that's got like magnetic pla for the core and they made a pretty nice nice motor which which is not open source um but yeah i think this this project would be quite quite important to get um get out there just just to show the collaborative development because the reward would be based on how people collaborate to make that happen so you'd have to structure it where you get rewarded for the fact that you're publishing and working openly with others to make it happen but i think that's 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 pretty important. Um, other than that, continuing on, there's background work on the 3D printers, and then Josh with the tractor and the power cubes, that's still alive in the background. 
aiming for the big deal on the immersion program so we can run regular workshops and give people full time full time involvement in a project so yeah with that I'd like to wrap it up here I think that's uh, we gone for quite a bit today so thanks again everybody and and we'll talk again next Tuesday 2 p.m. Um, so see you then take care